For God's people, it was a dark season. Many had completely turned away, while most had relegated his words to meaningless traditions passed down from their ancestors. Today, we dig into the life of Hezekiah and watch how God used one man to restore his people in a dark and discouraging time. Do you think this has any kind of practical applications for today? I sure do. Let's find out as we go on to the Back Shed Bible Study for Monday, August 23rd, 2021. It's episode number 70. Welcome. It's good to have you here today. Uh, we're looking forward to a, uh, a fun morning. And as I uh, looked at that introduction right there, it is uh, one that just made me, uh, it, it stopped me in my tracks the other day as I started to look at the life of Hezekiah. And uh, this was about a week ago that I was, uh, it was early in the morning, I was in the Word, I was reading through Second Chronicles, and, and as I had gone from bad king to bad king to bad king, up comes Hezekiah. And so today uh, we're going to be digging into Hezekiah. I'm excited to uh, bring you along with me in a little bit of a journey that God has been taking uh, me through. Uh, but as we get started, I want to say welcome. Donna, good to see you always, faithful friend. Uh, fun to have you along with us this morning as we're going on here. And, uh, and I see others jumping on as well. Uh, so, so to, to begin this conversation about Hezekiah, I'm going to, to start it and, and just be completely transparent with um, how I feel right now. You know, not that it's all about our feelings, because it isn't. Uh, those come and go. Uh, but as I have watched the news and been engaged with what's happening in our culture uh, over the last few days, uh, in weeks, but then months and the last few years, uh, I have to be honest when I say it's discouraging. It is discouraging uh, to watch what is happening in Afghanistan right now. No matter where you come from politically, whether you, you think the United States should have been in Afghanistan for the last 20 years or not, that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant to this conversation. Um, but what's happening there right now, today, um, in, in the, the torture of, of people under the now Taliban rule, um, the people desperately trying to flee this country, the, the, the awful pictures we've watched, uh, has just been incredibly discouraging uh, to engage with. And like I say, this is, this is not a political statement that I'm making. This is a statement simply about a circumstance that is happening across the world uh, where we see not only Americans that are in desperate places to, uh, to get out of there, but also Afghanis and people that are fleeing the persecution uh, that is to come or is is currently existing under the Taliban rule. Also, the number of uh, Christians in that country that are now forced to go underground and, um, uh, and, and in essence, face a uh, death sentence under the Taliban rule uh, simply for uh, being a follower of Christ. So uh, there's a lot to unpack with that. We're not digging into that. That's all for me to say that's been discouraging. And, and I, I kind of hope it's been discouraging for you. I hope you've been touched uh, as, as you've watched what's going on over there. And uh, I hope you've been drawn to pray. I hope you have uh, engaged with it. It's, it's real life news that is happening over there. Uh, but that's not it. I mean, if we start to go back over uh, these last, this last year, we see race riots uh, returning to the United States. We see um, uh, just a complete uh, political divide in this country, which is, you know, in essence, it's nothing new. And you've seen this throughout all kinds of uh, all parts of history. But you you see things happening today. Uh, you see the the mess that is uh, COVID 
the 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 delta variant if that doesn't kind of stick to you a little bit and go know a lot of people that uh that are uh, acquiring it now and several friends that have ended up in the emergency room some in icu uh, praise god that that um, those I know haven't, haven't passed on from it recently, um, but I know that uh, many who have, and I have done uh, a few funerals this last year for people uh, who succumbed to COVID. And it's, it's discouraging to look at. It is darkness uh, in our modern current day. And, uh, and then you, hello, sunshine. I don't know if you all heard that or not, but my dog saw some birds and just went crazy. Uh, so good morning, sunshine. But uh, um, so those are the things that when when things start to weigh heavy on my mind, those are some of those things that are weighing heavy on me. I don't know what discourages you. I don't know what gets you down. Um, uh, the state of today's culture uh, definitely gets me down. Now, as a pastor, um, obviously I know the big picture as, as no, no, hold on. That was the dumbest thing I've ever said. As a follower of Christ, I know the big picture. And the big picture is that in the, in the end, we have, uh, a relationship with the God of the universe who conquers Satan, who conquers death, who is the winner. Okay. That's, that's the big picture. And, and, and we all as followers of Christ have that hope in, uh, in the resurrection um, of Jesus Christ and the, the future resurrection of ourselves and, and, and all the saints and the redemption of, of all this pain on this earth. But today, today, if I was to tell you how I'm feeling, I'm discouraged. I'm discouraged watching the news. I'm discouraged looking at the people that are suffering. I'm discouraged. And so in, in a season of discouragement, um, before you start to judge me, this is where we're going to have some redemptive conversation in all of this. But in a, de season, in a season of discouragement, I've, I've been heading through the Old Testament, and, and I love the, the Bible plan that I'm on because it takes you chronologically through the Old Testament. And so you might be reading the prophet Isaiah at the exact same time that you're reading in Second Chronicles. And so you're seeing these prophetic pieces that were written at the, uh, at the time that uh, things were happening in um, the nation of Israel and among the 12 tribes and, and Israel and Judah were in a divided kingdom where we're going to pick things up today. And, uh, uh, but that's what I've been reading through. And last week I came across as I was going through second Chronicles, I've been in Isaiah for a little bit and, and I hit uh, second Chronicles chapter 29. And so if you're following along at home, you have a Bible with you, by all means, pull out that scripture. We're going to dig into it this morning and, and hopefully give you uh, a little bit of hope in the midst of a discouraging time. That's, that's the point here. And that is my job as a pastor is to offer hope. That's our job as followers of Christ to offer hope because we do know the big picture. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head into 2 Chronicles chapter 29. But before that, we want to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And if you're reading along, I'm on page 407 of my Bible. Yeah, if you have, if you have this one, that's where it is. Um, and we're going to talk about um, Hezekiah when Hezekiah became king of Judah. So to set a little context here, we have what is uh, commonly known in scripture as the divided kingdom. Um, under David, Israel was, was a nation and, and Solomon, and then, and then after that, um, the, as Rehoboam became king, the nation divided. And, and you had uh, Judah, the nation of Judah, which was one of the 12 tribes that, that stayed intact right there. That's where Jerusalem is and, and, um, and kind of as the base. And then you had what became the nation of Israel, um, which is the, the rest of the tribes. And they kind of divided off, had their own kings. And, and the, the storyline, as you go through the Old Testament, is very clear that, that pretty much every single king of Israel 
uh, from that point on were evil. They just did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, but you had a few good ones along the way uh, as kings over Judah. Not many, but you had a few good ones. Um, we get to Ahaz, and, and this is in the 700s BC, and you get to Ahaz, and, and this guy was, was a real interesting one. Um, he becomes king when he's 20 years old. This is in uh, Second Chronicles 28 to give us a little context for what we're going to get into next here. Uh, but he becomes king when he's 20, uh, 20 years old. He reigns um, in Jerusalem as king for 16 years. And, and the, uh, the writer of the Chronicles is uh, clear to say that unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel. Um, so the kings of Israel had this notorious uh, reputation for doing evil and following uh, idolatry, ultimately, is what it came down to. Uh, the thing that angered God so much in all of this, and the, the, the way to get on the wrong side of God um, is to fall into idolatry. And that's what these guys did. Um, um, Ahaz uh, burned sacrifices. He uh, engaged in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He burned incense in the high places, on the hilltops, under every spreading tree. And in, in essence, they're creating altars all over the place to offer sacrifices, not to the living God, uh, but to these gods of other nations that they had let kind of creep in. And, and a lot of us that have you know, kind of studied the Old Testament over time, we've, we've heard these stories. <laughs> um. At one point, he even, Ahaz, even um, goes into war against Israel. So, so, I mean, if you just think about this, you have God's people, Israel and Judah, even though it's a divided kingdom, these are, these are people that were all under um, Jacob. I mean, these are Jacob's sons and all the tribes of Jacob that are now divided against each other and fighting against each other. And, and Ahaz is goes to war there against Israel, and Israel starts to conquer them. And what you see as you read chapter 28 of Second Chronicles is that it's this, this moment where God hands them uh, into Israel, puts them in Israel's hands, and in essence, causes them to lose to Israel as a judgment in a way that God is judging Judah um, by giving them over to Israel. But what you'll find here is, is super fascinating in um, chapter 28 there, is that God becomes angry with Israel because they are torturing and beating and putting them into captivity, um, not just winning a battle or a war against them, but they are, are, are really stomping down on them. And, and God starts to judge Israel because of how harshly they are treating Judah, um, which are their brothers. Ultimately, they're their cousins. And so it's super fascinating uh, to study it. That's not what we came to study today. We came to talk about what's going to happen next. So I look at the end of chapter 28, and, um, and here's how it, it, it ends. Ahaz gathered together the furnishings from the temple of God, cut them in pieces. He shut the door of the Lord's temple. He set up altars at every street corner in Jerusalem. In every town in Judah, he built high places to burn sacrifices to other gods, and he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of his ancestors. That's what Ahaz did as a leader. He just destroyed it. Um, it says the other events in, uh, of his reign and all his ways from beginning to end are written in the annals of the kings of Judah and Israel. He rests with his ancestors, ancestors was buried in the city of Jerusalem, but not placed in the tombs of the kings of Israel. Yeah, he wasn't worthy of it, was he? And uh, Hezekiah, his son, succeeded him as king. So here we go. Let's jump into it. And uh, uh, pardon me if I start to race through some of this, because I don't want to keep you all day, but I think there's some, some good stuff here. Hezekiah, chapter 29, was 25 years old when he became king. Well, we have to stop for a moment because we find that Ahaz, his father, 
had been king in uh, Judah, if we go back to chapter 28, he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years, and he had become king when he was 20. Okay, so if I do the simple math, uh, 20 plus 16, Ahaz is 36 when he dies and Hezekiah becomes king. Hezekiah is 25, okay? So 36 minus 25, do the math. Everybody ready? 11. That tells me that Ahaz was 11 years old when he fathered Hezekiah. I ran into Luke's office this morning and said, Luke, I'm going to talk about Ahaz and Hezekiah this morning. Uh, do you have any uh, insights for me on the timeline of uh, Hezekiah's birth? And he just looked at me and said, uh, I don't have time for that. So I'm going to uh, save that for another day. And I'll tell you what, I will see if I can get a, a, a scholar, an Old Testament scholar on here, and we can talk through uh, one of these days about the differences between uh, Ahaz and Hezekiah and their age and whether it's, you know, now it's technically possible that that could have been the case or there could be another explanation. But like I said, we'll save that for another day. Alyssa, I love that you said, yikes. <laughs> That's what I said when I did the math. <laughs> like, fine. I don't know where I'm going to go with that, so I'm just not going to go there. Um, but there, I opened it up. Hey, never be afraid to ask questions in the Bible, right? Never be afraid to ask questions. It's uh, sometimes people are like, yeah, we got them. There's, that means the Bible is not accurate. Eh, sometimes there's an explanation, most of the time. All right, 29, but here's, here's what matters. Hezekiah is 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah. Um, uh, which uh, in other uh, texts is Abby. What a great name, A-B-I. Um, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's, uh, that's our title this morning. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And um, in, in Judah, the nation of Judah is coming off of a season of the kings doing what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord, especially Ahaz. And here comes somebody that did it right. And, and so the other morning at six in the morning, as I'm reading this, God just stopped me and just said, you're looking at all of this. You're, you're looking at a, uh, a nation in the United States that, that seems to have turned its back on God and leadership has. You're looking at curriculums in school that are anti-God in so many ways, anti-Christian. You're looking at um, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan and torture of Christians. You're looking at just torture of Afghans and, and so many others. And, and you see abject evil going on in the world and you're discouraged. And God slapped me across the face. And, and it was this thought, it only takes one generation to change. That, that God can use one generation to bring about radical change. Um, that's kind of the big picture point of today, okay? It only takes one generation to change. Now, unfortunately, we're going to find out at the end of Hezekiah's reign that his son steps in and does evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, but Hezekiah did what was right. And, and not only did he do what was right, he did it quickly. Check this out. Um, and so, so remember context, he's 25 years old when he becomes king in Israel. And it says in the first month, we're in uh, second Chronicles, for those of you that just joined in chapter 29, verse two, three, excuse me. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Just stop right there. The doors of the temple had been shut, had been sealed shut under the previous kings uh, and, and regimes that they were, it was just shut down. You know, this is the place where they were to go worship in Jerusalem. This is the place where the, the priests were to make their sacrifices. This is the place where the priests were to go into the Holy of Holies and, and be in the presence of the Lord. And they just shut the doors of the, of the temple says, he brought in the priests and Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side, and said, listen to me, Levites. 
consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook, forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. Oh, man, talking about snuffing out the lamp, snuffing out the light. Um, they Catch that. They looked back at their ancestors and said, they messed up. They did evil. They did wrong. They did this. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings. And therefore, the, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. And then they, they go on. But the, here's what happens. In, uh, if you skip down to verse 16, um, as the, the Levites are con uh, consecrating themselves, there weren't even enough priests to do the priestly duties. And so they had to have the Levites jump in and perform some of the priestly duties because there were so many priests that had fallen away and turned their back. Okay. So there aren't even enough priests to do the job. Okay. But it says verse 16, the priests went into the sanctuary of the Lord to purify it. They brought out to the courtyard of the Lord's temple, everything unclean that they found in the temple of the Lord. The Levites took it, carried it out to the Kidron Valley. So, um, so if you're at the temple in Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, and I, and I believe if I'm getting my directions right, sits uh, immediately to the right of, the, I'm sorry, to the right. <laughs> if you're looking at the temple from the south, uh, the Kidron Valley is over to the east side, um, uh, to the right side as you're coming from, from below. Um, but it's on the east side. And, and the Kidron Valley is, is, you know, when you think valley and think San Joaquin Valley, wrong way to think. Kidron Valley is just like a little tiny valley um, that you, I mean, you can walk from the Mount of Olives over to the temple in a matter of a half an hour or less um, through the Kidron Valley. Um, the Garden of Gethsemane sits on the edge of the Kidron Valley. And um, um, so it's not far from the temple. Um, but they take um, those articles out there, it says the Levites took it, carried it out to the Kidron Valley. They began the consecration on the first day of the month. And by the eighth day of the month, they reached the portico of the Lord. So they're working their way into the temple to go through and pull out all these things that either A, need to be removed from the temple or B, need to be cleansed. And, and as the uh, uh, word says to purify it, um, to consecrate these items. They need to be consecrated. They need to be set aside, set apart, um, consecrated, okay? For eight more days, they consecrated the temple of the Lord itself, and they finished on the 16th day of the first month. The 16th day of the first month of Hezekiah's rule, they finished this. Hezekiah stepped in when he had the power and authority to do so and immediately brought about change. He immediately he went straight to the temple, said, that's where it starts. It starts in the place where God's people worship. And they cleansed that thing. And, and they bring the right articles back in there. Two weeks, just a tad bit over two weeks it took uh, for them to cleanse the temple. Um, verse 19, we've prepared the consecrated uh, prepared and consecrated all the articles that King Ahaz removed in his unfaithfulness. They're now in front of the Lord's altar. <laughs> and, and they go back, and, and if you read at the end of chapter 29, and I'm going to skip through a few things here in the matter of time, it says, so the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people, because it was done so quickly. And, and here's the thing, and, and if we want to just pull out a, a little bit of a lesson out of, uh, from Hezekiah that we can learn right there, it's that when you know the right thing to do, do it quickly. Don't sit around and wait. Boy, I have, I have been stuck in that a few times where um, 
where I know what I want to do. I know what the right thing to do is. And, and sometimes I just get real slow going into it and, and take my time. And, and I think when, when we know the good we ought to do, I mean, scripture uh, clearly says he who knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Um, we need to do it and we need to do it quickly. Um, and uh, rather than drag it out. There are a lot of applications for that in, uh, in our uh, present day-to-day -day lives. Notice in chapter 30, it says Hezekiah, the, the heading there in my Bible says Hezekiah celebrates the Passover. It says at the king's commands, verse 6, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah, Israel and Judah, with the letters from the king. And, and so they were going out and they were going to tell people, we are going... We haven't celebrated the Passover in years. That's something God commands us to do. And in fact, um, and it wasn't even the time of the year to celebrate the Passover, but they hadn't done it in so many years that they said, we need to do this now. And so they set up a different time of the year to celebrate it just to do it because they, it had not been done in forever. In verse 10 of chapter 30, it says, the couriers went from town to town and Ephraim and Manasseh, as far as Zebulun. But people scorned and ridiculed them. When you do what's right, even um, people that know the right thing will often scorn and ridicule. I see, I see that happening all the, day, all the time today. I see Christians, followers of Christ, standing up for, for things that are right. I even see other Christians mock them for doing it. Um, I think I'm sometimes guilty of that every once in a while. Uh, it's easy to get cynical sometimes. Uh, but nevertheless, you, you know, if we go back to the context here, um, they send, send people out throughout the entire nation of Israel um, into Israel. Okay, so remember, not long ago, Israel had even tried to kind of take a lot of the, of the people of Judah into captivity. Um, they still went out because these are their cousins. These are God's people that share in the promise with them. And they take them out um, and they invite them to come and celebrate the Passover as far as Zebulun. But that says people scorn and ridicule them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. So those three tribes, uh, some from those three tribes uh, came back and, uh, and came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, uh, to remember what God had faithfully done to them, uh, for them so many years ago. Um, let's skip down here and, and we'll kind of wrap up in these next few things here. Uh, but this is, you know, and again, this is a little more devotional in nature rather than digging into the, the depths of a Bible study. Um, in chapter 31 at verse 2, it says, Hezekiah assigned the priests and Levites to divisions, each of them according to their duties uh, as priests and Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks, sing praises at the gates of the dwelling, um, of the Lord's dwelling. The king contributed from his own possessions for the morning and evening burnt offerings and for burnt offerings on the Sabbaths and new moons and the appointed festivals as written in the law of the Lord. I love how Hezekiah as a leader um, in this, and, and this is one of those just quick application points. As a leader, Hezekiah put his money where his mouth was. He says, you know, this is not just me as king uh, putting out an edict that you all should do this. Uh, and and in, a, in a moment here in the rest of chapter 31, we're going to find out that, that uh, they reestablish, in essence, the tithe. Um, and that people giving to the temple, giving to the priests and Levites. Um, and we're going to find out that they are giving in so much abundance that there is no need anymore, that the priests and Levites are coming back to Hezekiah going, there is so much coming in. It's amazing. Um, there is no need anymore. But it started with Hezekiah. It started with Hezekiah giving of his own resources, of his own wealth, and saying, I'm giving, you give too. And in that same way, you know, if we're, if we're going to expect uh, other people to, to follow Christ and to give that way, we should be uh, doing the same thing as well. 
<sighs> okay, so let's skip down and, and we'll kind of wrap things up here uh, with a couple last points. At the end of uh, chapter 31, uh, verse 20, it says, this is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commandments, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly. And so he prospered. Seek your God, work wholeheartedly. Seek your God, work wholeheartedly. Notice he didn't let the discouragement of the rest of the nations of Israel not wanting to be a part of the Passover, mocking them for doing this. He didn't let any of that stop him from doing what he knew was right because he was seeking his God. He wasn't seeking the approval of others. He wasn't seeking um, constantly the, you know, all of his advisors, advice, whatever. He was seeking his God. And then he worked wholeheartedly. He didn't sit there and go, well, I'm just going to pray about it. hope it all turns out right. He did things. He worked wholeheartedly. Um, in uh, chapter 32, we find out about Sennacherib, who, uh, who comes in and threatens Jerusalem and kind of lays siege to uh, Jerusalem. And we learn some fun things through that. Uh, we, uh, we see an allusion to... Uh, Hezekiah's tunnel, um, which is talked about in um, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 30, it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon, I think, spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. That was through a tunnel that was about 1,500 feet long through bedrock. Uh, I've walked through this tunnel. It is incredible to go through this tunnel. And you know, when they, when they built this thing, they started at two ends, and, and it was a winding tunnel uh, and ended up meeting at a, at a spot mostly in the middle. And they were within like a foot of each other when they finally met there in the middle. There was a, a monument uh, that was made to it there that was later stolen um, and, and is still not in the hands of the Israelites. But that's another story for another day from some Bible scholars that can uh, shed some light on that for us. Um, but Hezekiah did a, did a lot of pretty amazing things, um, but he still was human and he still did some dumb things. So here, here is the thing. Um, and sometimes we get this, we, we put, we elevate leaders up and we think that everything that this leader does is right, you know, and when they mess up, we make excuses for them. Um, uh, we see that in politics all the time, because if this leader's politics, if this politician's politics agree with mine, then I'm willing to excuse their, their, you know, things and go, eh, they, they you know, they, they just, yeah, no, they, no, they wasn't wrong what they did, you know, and, um, you know, and, and I'm seeing that today, even a little bit with like, hey, you know, just because you like the president doesn't mean he's doing this current thing right. Okay. And that's okay to say I, there, that's the most political thing you may ever hear from me. Um, but what it comes, what, sorry, that was a distraction. I may go back and edit that out for the permanent version. We'll see. Um, but what I was going to come back to is if you look at verse 24 of uh, chapter 32, um, it says, in those days, Hezekiah became ill, was to the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. And therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. And then Hezekiah, this is the key, verse 26, Hezekiah repented. Okay. He repented of the pride of his heart as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. So the, the quick uh, application for us today is, you know, you could be seeking the Lord in, in almost every way, but at some point along the way, your humanity, your sinful nature is going to get the best of you, and you are going to say or do something that is wrong. Um, and, and often pride is, is the basis of it. 
the key it, it it wasn't that hezekiah did this like that actually is not the bigger deal in this story the the bigger deal is that when called on it hezekiah repented and notice that the the nation um thank you sharon i appreciate that um notice that the the nation got god's blessing because hezekiah repented of his pride Notice that the nation was blessed with a time of, uh, what did it say? Um, the people of Jerusalem, um, therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. <sighs> that's, that's what I love. I know Hezekiah followed like, like David. David, when called out on his sin, repented still known as the, the man after God's own heart. Hezekiah, very much like David, when called out on his pride, repented. And, and it would not surprise me if God looked at Hezekiah and say, man after my heart, right there. How long did it take for Hezekiah to restore the temple from the time he started ruling? 16 days. Challenge to us, don't wait. When you know what's right, don't wait. Do it. Um, repent when we need to repent. Uh, there you go. If you're discouraged about what's going on today, we're only one generation from transformation. It takes one generation, one, one person to say, that's wrong. I'm going to stand up for what's right. I'm going to turn and go the right way. And I'm going to do everything within my influence to make that happen. Uh, and, and, and notice that, that I, th I think back about this, Hezekiah went to the other nations and said, hey, let's all jump on board together and, and get this right. But he didn't, when they didn't come, he didn't go keep trying to get them. He just said, all right, that's fine, but we're going to do what's right. Judah is going to do what's right because I have control over Judah. Um, you know, he didn't go try to conquer them to get them to do what was right. He sent emissaries out there to say, come on, come on. This is, this is a good thing. Um, and sometimes we need to be okay when not everybody else decides to follow along or when they, when they make fun of us or, or whatever it is. Uh, so there you go. Second Chronicles, what a wealth um uh, of information in there um uh, i'd encourage you go back there uh start at chapter 28 i mean read the whole thing of course uh but but today's uh we're based upon chapters 28 through 32 and uh one man uh who became king in in the midst of a whole line of people who weren't doing it right but one man who did what was right in the eyes of the lord that's what god calls us to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord and, uh, and let him take care of the rest and, and, and do it. Right. Fun stuff this morning. Um, actually not fun. I, I don't know that this is fun. I say that phrase a lot, but, uh, it, it's disheartening to, to watch, um, a godless world out there and yet completely encouraging to know that, that we serve the God of all creation the God who has complete control over all these things. And so we don't need to despair. We just need to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And again, the title of today, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. I pray that every one of us, this is my prayer as we close. My prayer to the Lord is God, that every one of us that are your followers of Christ would do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you, Donna. Appreciate your kind words. I, uh, I think that is, I, I agree. I think this is relevant for, for all of us as followers of Christ today. Um, I hope you will all join me next week. We are going to have, uh, in my eyes, a very special guest. So um, our guest next week is a, I believe, 
he may be a Grammy award winning uh, singer and songwriter by the name of Brent Lamb. I'll have to go back and double check some of my stuff, but Brent Lamb is going to be with us next week. You may, uh, you may not recognize his name, but Brent was uh, uh, back in the day was in a band called Shenandoah. Uh, he was a Nashville recording artist turned uh, pastor uh, and uh, Brent's getting a little podcast starting up and uh, we get to have him live on the back shed on the very day uh, that his new uh, podcast is uh, starting up. So that's going to be a special treat. And um, just so full context, Brent's a, an old friend of April's and mine, Brent and his wife, Lori, and, and uh, we got to know him through Hume Lake, go figure. And uh, so he'll be joining us and talking about um, how God works in, uh, in the Nashville world. Uh, and I'm not talking about just in the city. I'm talking about in the industry, the music industry and, and, uh, how God's been able to use them over the years through that. So, uh, it should be a real fun conversation with Brent. He's an old friend of, uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman. It was one of my favorites ever. Um, they've written, done some, a lot of fishing together and writing of songs together. So, um, some fun, hopefully we'll get some fun stories with Brent, uh, as he joins us here in the back shed next week. Don't forget if you enjoyed this, please share it with other people, click the share button, uh, let other people hear about it. Um, subscribe to the podcast version. If you can, you just go on to, uh, uh, iTunes, or if you're on, um, Google, you just, just Google back shed Bible study and, uh, the podcast will show up. You can subscribe that way. Um, leave us a review, leave comments, let us know. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I like it. I like the shed. We're going to keep this thing going. Thanks for joining us, everyone. God bless you. And, uh, we will see you next week, right back here on the back shed. Bye-bye.